Hello, everyone. My name is Marlene Watson. I'm the Director of Training at the Acumen Institute for the Family. Uh, it is indeed an honor to welcome you to tonight's lecture. Uh, before introducing our esteemed speaker, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people who have behind the scenes made this possible. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge Melissa, who is with us tonight. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Shauna, Jamie, and Brenda for the support that they have um, uh, given to this Distinguished Family Therapy Lecture Series from its inception. Tonight's lecture is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, we will send that to you when it is available. Uh, no attendees will be included in the recording due to lack of consent. Uh, we therefore will not have any attendees visible at any point in the lecture. Uh, questions and answers will be at the end. We ask that you use the Q&A feature for uh, questions. And I will read those questions uh, to Dr. Turner so that uh, he doesn't have to uh, get distracted uh, looking for those. Uh, uh, and uh, now it is my very great privilege to introduce uh, Dr. William L. Turner. Dr. Turner holds a distinguished professorship in leadership and public policy and serves on the executive leadership team as counselor to the president at Lipscomb University on matters of equity, diversity, and strategic community engagement. He is an expert in family, community, and public health. His extensive and lauded academic career has included tenured full professorships at Vanderbilt University, the University of Minnesota, and the University of Kentucky. And from 2007 to 2009, he worked for then Senator, later President Barack Obama as a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow and Legislative Advisor. Dr. Turner's program of research is conceptually grounded in systems theory and other ecological perspectives. And his research has centered on themes related to African-American family strengths and their relationship to health and mental health prevention and intervention. Recently, his teaching and research interests are focused on those intersections of hope, justice, policy, and faith. He is the principal investigator of the Hope Laboratory, a translational research program that focuses on the application of hope theories, system theories, and positive psychology principles in systems and organizations at multiple levels. He has served on study sections of the National Institutes of Health for Prevention, Epidemiology, and Risk and National Institute of Mental Health Study Section on Prevention and Health Behaviors. Dr. Turner is a former associate editor of the Journal of Marital and Family Therapy, and he serves on the editorial boards of several academic journals. He is a former board member and officer of the Family Process Institute. He's also a recipient of honors and awards, including the American Family Therapy Academy, Distinguished Contribution to Social Justice Award, and the National Council on Family Relations Sussman Award for Outstanding Contribution to Research. And I am very happy to say that I am his professional big sister. So welcome, Dr. Turner. Great. Thank you so much, Marlene. Uh, it's uh, so wonderful to be here with all of you tonight. And I'm especially uh, grateful that uh, uh, Marlene asked me to do this. As Marlene said, Marlene is truly uh, my uh, not only professional big sister, but she is just one of the dearest friends that I have in this world. And I really uh, appreciate her so much for the uh, wonderful human being that she is, for the extraordinary scholar and clinician that she is, and for all of the ways that she has been a mentor to me throughout my uh, life and career. Uh, it is great to be here with you tonight. Uh, uh, at the uh, Ackerman Distinguished Lecture Award. I am so honored to be able to uh, 
uh, to be asked to do this. I, I mean, I count it as an award, I said award, but it is just such a wonderful uh, privilege to be able to do this. And especially to be able to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and my soul. Uh, I enjoy thinking about and studying ideas that relate to hope and how those uh, ideas can be uh, not only transformative, uh, to us in the um, uh, field that we are all so um, engaged in as family therapist. But I just think as a human being and a citizen of the world, I think especially at this particular time uh, in our history, being able to be able to focus on ideas that relate to, to hope and, 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 and sort of positive virtues that we all should be striving to be more in tune with in this world. Uh, when I first uh, uh, was asked to do this, it was back in October, I think, of last year, and, uh, and, and, and the big uh, global uh, crisis that we were all experiencing, and still are to some extent, uh, was the uh, uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, again, we see some light at the end of the tunnel on that, and things are getting better. But uh, it has been really a difficult time, I think, for many of us over the last you know, a couple of years having to deal with those kinds of issues. And then of late, uh, we have a new uh, reason to experience some global despair because of what's happening uh, in the Ukraine. And I'm really uh, mindful of um, the suffering that so many of our, uh, you know, brothers and sisters around the world are going through because of this uh, horrible um, uh, uh, atrocity upon mankind. And so as we think about hope tonight and reflect on it, that's another area of global despair that we have to be mindful of. And so uh, again, um, I'm excited about talking about this topic tonight and what it might, uh, and, and some ideas that we might be able to put across uh, on, on this topic. I wanna begin though by reading a poem that was written at the beginning of the pandemic, I think in, the early part of uh, uh, 2020. And this is probably a poem that many of you have already heard or thought about, but I wanted to read it to sort of set the stage and, and uh, provide a kind of context for us as we enter into this uh, conversation tonight. And it's called What If by Gurpreet K. Gill. Uh, and it goes this way. There is so much fear, and perhaps rightly so, about COVID-19. And what if, if we subscribe to the philosophy that life is always working out for us, that there is an intelligence far greater than humans at work, that all is interconnected? What if the virus is here to help us, to reset, to remember? What is truly important? Reconnecting with family and community, reducing travel so that the environment, the skies, the air, our lungs all get a break. Parts of China are seeing blue sky and clouds for the first time in forever with the factories being shut down. Working from home rather than commuting to work less pollution, more personal time, reconnecting with family as there is more time at home, an invitation to turn inward, a deep meditation rather than the usual extroverted going out to self-soothe, to reconnect with self, what is really important to me, a reset economically, the working poor, the lack of health care access for over 30 million in the United States, and the need for paid sick leave. How hard does one need to work to be able to live, to have a life outside of work, to face our mortality, check back into living life rather than simply working, working, working to reconnect with our elders so who are so susceptible to this virus. And washing our hands, 
how did that become a new thing that we needed to remember? But yes, we did. The presence of grace for all. There is a shift underway in our society. What if it is one that is favorable for us? What if this virus is an ally in our evolution? In our remembrance of what it means to be connected, humane, living a simpler life, to be less impactful, more kind to our environment. An offering from my heart this morning, offered as another perspective, another way of relating to this virus, this unfolding, this evolution. It was time for a change. And we all knew that. And change has arrived. What if? When I uh, uh, came across this uh, poem uh, two years ago, again, when we were at the beginning of the pandemic, it was a really um, meaningful thing for me to, uh, to see that and to hear that, uh, because I think it uh, reminded me that rather than being so uh, um, uh, distraught and overwhelmed and hopeless about what was going on, Perhaps this was time for a reframe, a change, a look differently at what was going on and what might be happening in the world. And it was a chance for us to grow and to change and to be better. And, um, and so it gave me some hope. And that's what our topic is about today, is about ways of getting hope, uh, ways of acquiring hope, ways of becoming more hopeful, ways of looking at things that are desperate, uh, that cause us to be in uh, periods of despair and how we might be able to move on from those. Before I begin tonight, I would like to acknowledge those upon uh, whose work this presentation is based, uh, whose uh, 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 experiences and research and uh, clinical work and writing have really meant a lot to me. Some of these people I know and I know quite well, others of them I only know of them professionally. I've read their writing and I know them in that way, but it's, they, their work has meant a lot to me. So I'd like to thank, of, uh, thank one of my other big sisters, uh, Paulette Moore Hines. Many of you know Paulette, who lives in New Jersey and just recently retired uh, uh, from Rutgers University. Uh, Harry Aponte, who's written about hope over the years. And I know Harry was one of your uh, uh, distinguished lecturers earlier this year. Uh, from a Walsh, who has uh, done a great deal of work over the years uh, in the area of hope and hopefulness and resilience. And I think all of those ideas go hand in hand. Uh, uh, Kathy Weingarten, whose work in this area has been uh, seminal and very important and has really taken us in a very different direction. And then Martin Seligman, uh, the positive psychologist from the University of uh, Pennsylvania, who spent uh, much of his life looking at ideas uh, that looked at the virtues of life rather than the things that are, um, are, are pathological or that uh, are dysfunctional. And then I really like to thank my grandmother, uh, Elizabeth Turner, who uh, taught me the value of being a hopeful person. And I think in many ways has uh, influenced uh, me greatly in being able to uh, uh, think about this work and to undertake this work. Uh, the purpose of this presentation, this presentation is about hope and despair and the way in which uh, family therapists, as family therapists, we meet to uh, engage uh, with uh, this part of the territory of human experience. Uh, for many families, the experience of hope and despair is complex, and it can reflect a constellation of individual and family histories, uh, current patterns and dynamics, and stressors, stresses in everyday life, uh, the severity and the uh, chronicity of a uh, family struggle, and their uh, exposure to abuse, adversity, tragedy, and social injustice. And you know, it's very interesting. I think. Um, Hope and despair go hand in hand. And in some ways, it's hard to appreciate one or to truly experience one without having experienced uh, the other. 
uh, unfortunately, too often we get mired in despair and hopelessness and can't seem to find our way toward being a much more hopeful uh, individual. And beyond these immediate and personal constellations lie uh, the overarching uh, cultural and social context that create the social conditions of uh, individuals and families, our uh, relationships to hope uh, and, and despair. Uh, given the social and economic and political times in which we all live, we are repeatedly confronted uh, with the issues of hope and hopelessness. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, when we, uh, uh, when I was first asked to think about this, there were two things that were really on my mind. One was the uh, uh, pandemic and all of the suffering and uh, uh, frustration that uh, we as a nation and we as a globe have experienced. Uh, the losses that we have experienced in terms of, 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 of loved ones and uh, people that we know, the losses that we've had in uh, uh, relationships and connections as we've been somewhat isolated from one another over a period of time, and uh, just other losses that were associated with the uh, uh, pandemic. But we'd also gone through a period of uh, particularly in this country, but across the nation of, of sort of racial reckoning. Uh, we had experienced in the last um, uh, a, a couple of years, the losses of uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, and uh, so many others, just too numerous to count. And it made us become much more aware of how divided and separate we were and indeed still are. And, uh, and even today, we can still see that as we are going through the process of uh, selecting a new Supreme Court justice and just the um, um, varied and diverse ways that people have experienced that, uh, uh, that, that opportunity. You know, we've gone through a time of, uh, of uh, a political uh, turmoil and uh, where we as a nation have never been much more divided than we are right now. And again, this is not just an incident that is happening in the United States, but we see those same kinds of dynamics occurring across the globe. And then as uh, we mentioned, now we are undergoing this horrible, horrible uh, atrocity in Ukraine where people have been um, uh, uh, separated from their families, people have been killed, they have, their lives have been uh, uh, just uh, gone through such upheaval and uh, such pain and uh, suffering and uh, torture. It's just has been an awful thing to experience. So as therapists, we sometimes feel overwhelmed about the possibility that the problems that we and our clients are presented with, whether those things can ever be resolved, and particularly in this day and time in the world in which we live. Uh, some clients, in contrast, appear to be undaunted, and, are e and we're either amazed at their survival skills or convinced that they are somehow in a state of denial. Uh, in other instances, our clients convey a sense of hopelessness, a dis-ease of spirit, while we as therapists see possibilities and struggle to help them free themselves from self-imposed limitations. And a third scenario is one in which both our clients and we ourselves have a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And one of the things that I wanna talk about tonight is not only the um, experiences that those that we work with that our clients experience uh, this hopelessness and helplessness that we sometimes experience, but we ourselves as the providers, as the uh, caregivers, as the uh, helping professionals feel helpless and hopeless ourselves. And so I think we have to be very mindful of, uh, of that and how uh, those kinds of things might be, um, uh, occurring and happening uh, in the world in which uh, 
uh, in, in, in which we live. In spite of all of the pull of our clients uh, uh, with, uh, uh, who, who want to know the answers to uh, their problems, uh, neither our personal lives nor our uh, clients for, nor our professional training have always prepared us to envision uh, the answers to uh, some of the dilemmas that we face. We must also confront the reality that there are some problems for which there be which, for which there may be no uh, complete resolution either immediately or in the long term. And you know that's just the sad truth. There are some things that are going to be really, 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 really difficult to change, or at least uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the short term, and maybe even in the long term. And so it might be important for us to think differently about how we even uh, think about what is uh, hope. Uh, as Kathy Weingarten has talked about, uh, she talks about this idea of reasonable hope. Uh, uh, further defining that in a way that's different than how we normally think about it. And so um, uh, that, that's one of the ideas that I would like to, to uh, uh, spend some time thinking about or talking about uh, with you uh, tonight. So in the face of such circumstances, uh, the ability to convey and to encourage hope is key uh, to uh, retaining clients uh, in the helping process and to motivating them to make uh, behavioral and cognitive shifts that can enhance uh, their functioning and improve the quality of their lives. Uh, one of the things that I wanna touch on tonight too, and I think it's a really important thing that often we don't think about as much uh, as family therapists is the uh, larger system in which we live and the way that that system truly impacts us as individuals and as families and how it impedes or hurts us as in terms of our ability to be hopeful and to be resilient. Um, we are uh, family therapists, but sometimes, and, and are very much systems thinkers, but sometimes we become actually fairly reductionistic in the way we think about the systems that really uh, influence us or that impact us. And we only think about our family system, maybe our uh, uh, extended family, or we think about our intergenerational relationships, or perhaps we even think about the community that we live in, but not necessarily uh, the larger social system uh, in which we live. And so uh, that's important to think about, particularly when we think about matters of uh, justice and particularly injustice and social justice and social injustice and how those kinds of uh, ideas impact uh, individuals that come into our therapy rooms. And although for many families and particularly families of color, they may not come to you with that as the uh, um, uh, presenting problem that they can articulate in a way that might make sense to you, the therapist, particularly if you're not a, uh, a person who comes from uh, that uh, community or who is not so attuned to uh, social injustice yourself. But those kinds of things can have a very huge impact on the families that we serve and particularly with respect to uh, their feelings of hope and hopefulness. So how we think about hope has to do with whether we can co-create hopefulness with our clients and whether we can maintain our own hopefulness. This is an idea that Kathy uh, Weingarten has uh, uh, written about extensively in, 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 in several of her works. And uh, I will be sending uh, to uh, Marlene a, a, a reference list or bibliography of the, not only the works that I uh, include in my uh, presentation tonight, but also uh, uh, that uh, are, uh, I think will be useful for you uh, to think about and to read about 
uh, as uh, you go forward, as you go forth. So while family therapists work to restore hope in hopeless families, their ideas about hope and how to promote it are often implicit and not explicit in their practice. And you know, it's really interesting uh, in our field, there have been very few works that have explicitly uh, uh, addressed ideas of hope. Um, in, a, um, uh, in a literature review that was done a few years ago, uh, but less than a decade ago, there had been only one article uh, at the time in the um, uh, 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 marriage and family therapy literature, one uh, article in a marriage and family therapy journal that dealt with hope either uh, uh, explicitly or that had it as a name in the title. And there had only been uh, two or three books that had been written on the topic in the field of marriage and family therapy. Fast forward to 2022, there are now uh, four articles that have been written about in the uh, uh, marriage and family therapy journals and about uh, six books uh, and book chapters that have been written about uh, in, um, uh, uh, that specifically deal with marriage and family therapy. And so it's a topic that we haven't really dealt with explicitly uh, nearly enough. We do, however, deal with it very implicitly. And I think it is uh, involved in almost everything that we do and what we talk about, although we don't really address it as such and call it as such. Now, other disciplines have been much more um, uh, uh, overt in doing this. If you look in the medical literature, uh, uh, particularly among MDs and nurses, and even in the public health literature, they've embraced this idea of hope and hopefulness or hopelessness uh, quite vigorously. And uh, there are lots of uh, articles that have been written in that literature that explicitly deal with this topic. Not only that, but the National Institutes of Health and the National Institutes of Mental Health have funded research projects that uh, look at these ideas uh, in, some, uh, in some detail. And so uh, uh, again, it's not something that we have spent uh, the degree of time and effort uh, that we could have, and I think should have in our field uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to focus upon. But family therapists like um, uh, uh, Froma Walsh and uh, 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 Harry Aponte have written extensively about uh, these uh, concepts of hope, hopelessness, despair, and resiliency. And, uh, and, and again, uh, Froma in particular, Froma Walsh in particular has written a lot about resilience and in the work that she does on resilience uh, embedded in that, implicit in that is this idea of hopefulness. And she even talks about that quite a lot. Uh, uh, Harry uh, Aponte wrote a, published a book in 1994 that uh, spoke uh, to this uh, idea uh, uh, quite uh, explicitly. So considerable research evidence documents the strong effects of an optimistic orientation with respect to coping with stress and with crisis. Uh, epidemiologists find that positive illusions sustain hope in the face of crisis, such as threatening illness or enabling uh, people uh, to uh, overcome uh, all sorts of difficulties uh, in their, in, uh, uh, and improve their best efforts to overcome uh, 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 the, the negative odds that they might uh, experience. Uh, someone has written, what oxygen is to the lung, so is hope to the meaning of life. Uh, and again, uh, uh, it has been written about quite a lot in, uh, in, um, um, in medicine, uh, in nursing, and in the area of positive psychology, which really came in the mainstream in the early 1990s, they have embraced uh, this topic quite a lot. 
but it hasn't been uh, really explicitly viewed in the uh, domain of marriage and family therapy uh, per se. We have, um, uh, uh, we, we do know that this is a topic that's been talked about quite a lot in uh, other uh, disciplines. Uh, uh, philosophy has uh, embraced the idea of hope uh, for, uh, for ages going centuries back. We know that it's part of uh, theology and theological studies. And, uh, and uh, it has been, I, I think, for many of us, seen as being the purview of uh, you know, theology and uh, maybe philosophy, uh, maybe literature, uh, but not necessarily of mental health. Uh, Harry Aponte back in 1994 wrote about hope and despair uh, uh, in, in, in a book that he published. Uh, and he said in that book, many families in chronically impoverished minority ghettos have lost hope, uh, suffering a deprivation of both bread and spirit in the persistent racism, lack of opportunity, and failure of our society, uh, of our social net, of our social safety net. And so even then, you know, uh, Harry talked about how we had lost, you know, hope, uh, that many of our families had lost hope. And, uh, and, uh, and one of the um, responsibilities of a uh, family therapist, one of the, uh, Call, calls of marriage and family therapist, couple and family therapist was to uh, uh, imbue families who had lost hope with a sense of hopefulness. Aponte also states that the poverty of despair robs them of meaning and purpose. Uh, Cornell West, uh, the um, uh, philosopher, uh, uh, wrote that when the present is bleak, we must sustain hope in order to envision and strive for a better future. So uh, again, recognizing that hope is an important uh, variable, an important quality for living a meaningful and purposeful and full life. Hope for a better life for their children keeps many parents uh, from being defeated by their immediate plight. Hope is one of the things that keeps uh, people going forward and moving forward in a way that is um, uh, helpful and, uh, and uh, meaningful to living a full and uh, uh, successful life. Uh, in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. And you know that was one of the um, qualities of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. that I think uh, had such resonance with uh, particularly African American people at the time who were in. Uh, desperate circumstances, uh, uh, and particularly in the southern part of the United States. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, where uh, that legacy of, uh, of uh, Jim Crow and slavery and all of that stuff is all too real. Even today, things are much better, but it's still real here. Uh, uh, but King talked about that and believed that and um, uh, really uh, uh, convey that message uh, whenever he could, in whatever circumstances, uh, he uh, would find himself in. Uh, Hope-filled persons are resilient, uh, and, and hope-filled persons and families are resilient. Uh, resilient uh, persons are uh, masters of the art of the possible. Uh, they, uh, their stock, uh, they take stock of their situation, uh, the challenges, the constraints, and uh, the, the resources, and then focus their energies on making the most of their options. So resilience 
requires us to accept the limits of our power, uh, appraising, but uh, power, appraising what we can and cannot change, and then putting their best effort into what is possible. And so one of the hallmarks of resilience, and again, this is an idea that has been popularized and has come about a lot in the, in the literature, in our literature, in the last uh, couple of decades, is uh, uh, based on this idea of hope and hopefulness. Martin Seligman's uh, concept of learned optimism has uh, 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 important implications for cultivating hope and resilience. So it's really about perseverance. It's a lot about perseverance. Um, uh, so uh, in his earlier work on learned helplessness, he found that people can be conditioned to give up trying um, to solve problems. Uh, when people learn that their actions are futile and nothing they do matters, they no longer initiate uh, action and become passive, uh, dependent, and hopeless. This despair can deplete the immune system, it can impair physical health, and it can hasten death. Uh, interestingly, Seligman's own family experience contributed to his insight uh, when he was 13 years old when his father was paralyzed by a series of strokes that left him in um, uh, his own words, physically and emotionally helpless. That foundation shaking event first depressed the boy, Martin Seligman, but later lit fire in him to do something to understand and to overcome uh, that problem. And of note, Seligman, um, uh, shifted his research attention to learned optimism when he reached the same age as his father had been at the time of his uh, uh, paralysis. Uh, the question that intrigued him was this, why did it spark that fire and not render him helpless too? But Seligman became convinced that the difference had to do with initiative, dogged determination and persistence. As he said, I don't lie down and die. So Seligman contended that if helplessness can be learned, then it can be unlearned by successful experiences in which people come to believe that their efforts and actions can work. Yet a cheerful mind set is not sufficient conditions must offer predictable and achievable rewards to reinforce uh, efforts. And so it's really important uh, uh, in order to be a hopeful person that uh, uh, people understand uh, the concept of perseverance. And I think one of the things that we can do as family therapists with the families with whom we work and the individuals with whom we work is to help them to understand this idea, this concept, and to help them to find ways in their world, in their lives of developing a sense of perseverance. Encouragement and confidence are also extraordinarily important. The extraordinary courage shown by an ordinary person can also have profound meaning and inspiration for others, encouraging them to be bold. Rosa Parks is well remembered as an African-American woman whose refusal to sit in the back of the bus became an inspiring moment at the start of the civil rights movement. 
Now, it's really interesting. I never had the opportunity personally to meet Rosa Parks, but I happened to be very dear friends with her attorney, uh, uh, Fred Gray, who was not only the attorney for uh, Rosa Parks, but uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, John Lewis, as well as others at that time in, uh, uh, in their lives. And he tells me stories about Rosa Parks all the time uh, when, when, uh, when we meet. Uh, and, um, and he shared with me that she is this person who was just truly determined to have a better life uh, than uh, her parents had had, than uh, she was even living in the present moment. And even if it meant for her to, uh, um, uh, you know, go to jail or to uh, have some of her uh, rights impeded, she was willing to do that in that moment. Her example and her courage have really been an inspiration to uh, millions of people, people at the time, and people even today are inspired and encouraged by who she was and what she did. One's courage and encouragement, uh, uh, one's courage and the encouragement, uh, a family and a community are, are intertwined. Supportive relationships build and sustain courage, especially in the face of overwhelming odds. For instance, in the gay community, uh, the formation of strong social networks or families of choice have been vital in sustaining the lives of persons who are dealing first with AIDS and then with some of the social injustices that have been uh, imposed upon them uh, over the years. And uh, courage is shown every day in everyday life uh, of the uh, ordinary families, uh, the courage that they show and that they have often goes unnoticed. Uh, in the um, uh, projects in Chicago, parents and their children must pass gangs and drug infested courtyards daily to go to work and to school. Returning at night is, as ha is very hazardous. A, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Linda Burton, who is the Dean of the School of uh, Social Work at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, conducted a study uh, on families in that, uh, 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 in, in that city and in that, uh, uh, in, 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 in that uh, housing project uh, 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 a, a few years ago. And in her study uh, of the family impact uh, uh, of the neighborhood violence. Uh, she interviewed mothers, uh, it, it revealed enormous courage in st stealing themselves each morning to get uh, their families through another harrowing day and trying against the odds to get ahead so that their children could have a better life. Uh, in families that coped the best, mothers had learned carefully uh, to discriminate street sounds and activities for immediate risk of danger and tried to keep a watchful eye on their children as best they could. A again, these were people who were living in uh, environments that were hurtful and harmful, and yet uh, they found ways through hope and through uh, persistence to find a way forward to overcome uh, the uh, odds that they found themselves in. And so we truly do need models and mentors for hope and resilience. We often fail to see the many examples of heroism in our own families and in our own communities, but it's really important that we, that we do that and that we help our clients to see those uh, things and that uh, we help them to find ways uh, to uh, move forward in those and in, in that regard. In, in a, um, a chapter that uh, from a Walsh uh, uh, published uh, a couple of decades ago, she shares a story uh, 
about a uh, young girl who uh, writes about her mother uh, as she uh, leaves home every day to uh, uh, support and care for her daughter as a single parent living in a uh, uh, harsh condition. And this is the story that she tells, this little girl writes about her mother. I watch from the house and wonder how does she do it? How does she always remember to give me $3.60 for lunch money? How does she always remember to tell me that she loves me? How does she work all night and do errands all day? How does she raise me and my sisters on, my, on her own? She never gives up or says, I can't go today. She never ever doesn't get up, no matter how little sleep she's gotten. That's a beautiful story and a wonderful story. And again, I think helping our families understand and to see uh, the examples that are there uh, that are important uh, in their lives can help provide hope uh, for the families with whom we work. Transcendent beliefs are another important part of hope and hopefulness. Transcendent beliefs provide meaning and purpose beyond ourselves, our families, and immediate crisis situations. The need to find greater meaning in our lives is most commonly met through religious or spiritual faith and cultural heritage. And I wanna spend a little bit of time right now talking about uh, religious and spiritual faith and cultural heritage. Uh, particularly the religious and cultural faith part of it. Because I think all too often, we have not in our field spoken about this enough. It may also be found in ideological views uh, such as deep philosophical or political convictions. Transcendent beliefs often offer clarity about our life and solace in distress. They render unexpected events less threatening and enable acceptance of uh, situations that cannot be changed. Their values and purposes that are part of this transcendent uh, understanding. Values and purpose. Understanding the connectedness of life as a whole in relation to others involves a sense of higher values, purpose, and meaning. To accept this inevitable risk and losses in loving, families need a system of values and beliefs that transcends the limits of their experience and knowledge. This enables family members to view their particular reality, which may be painful, and uncertain and frightening from the perspective that makes some sense of the event and allows for hope. Without such perspectives, we are vulnerable to despair. Transcendent values, whether conventional or unique, enable us to define our lives in meaningful ways. You know, I often think about uh, my ancestors. Um, you know, um, some people, when they talk about slaves and their families, they are talking about many, many, many generations ago. But in my family, to be quite honest, it was more immediate. My great grandfather was a slave. Uh, my grandmother's father was a slave. Now you ask, how can that be? Are you that old? Uh, no, I'm not. But I, it, it just was the particular circumstances of my family. My father was the youngest of 11 children. He came, he was born uh, uh, later in my uh, grandparents' lives. My grandmother was the youngest of 11 children, and she was born very late in the life of her uh, parents. And so 
my grandfather, my great grandfather who died in 1947 had been born into slavery uh, and had lived as a slave until he was freed as a slave in uh, uh, 1865. So when I listen to stories from my, uh, about slavery as I grow up, and as now I'm able to tell my own daughter stories about it, it has an immediacy to it. My grandmother, to whom I was very close, with whom I was very close, would tell me these stories. And I, I, it was just amazing. And one of the things that was true about my uh, great grandfather is even though he was born in slavery when he died, he was actually a very successful man. He had been able to go on and become a, a landowner and had uh, been able to provide nicely for his family and was one of the few uh, persons of color in North Carolina where I grew up who owned things. But when they talk about that, it's a very meaningful experience to me. Uh, and and and, uh, and, and, and a real experience because it's somebody I know, it's not some distant uh, ancestor, it's somebody that my grandmother was close to. And so I think, uh, but keeping that story alive and understanding that uh, is important to me and, and for other generations of people in my world, whether they happen to be members of my family or extended family, or whether it's part of my family, therapy family, like you all this evening that I share those kinds of things with. The um, fact that that was uh, real and that was true and that was immediate to me has had a huge impact on me in my life. And so although my grandfather was born in slavery, I have served as a tenured full professor at three major research universities. When I was at Vanderbilt University, I used to walk on campus by the statue of Cornelius Vanderbilt. And I was sure that he rolled over his grave every time I walked past that because he never anticipated that uh, a person like me would even go to Vanderbilt University, let alone be there as a distinguished professor. Uh, and so, uh, uh, understanding that, that there are possibilities, that there is hope, and that we can transcend the realities that we find ourselves in, I think are important things for us to know and for us to remember. In today's cynical social and political climate, holding ideals may seem naive, and yet, they are needed more than ever in facing unprecedented challenges. In times of tragedy, whether the ravages of war, which again, we find ourselves in the midst of, and we have the specter of World War III uh, right at our um, doorsteps, or a terrorist bombing, or the brutal assault of a child, it requires strong, idealistic beliefs to hold fast to fundamental values to strive for a better day. And I would say that for many folks and particularly for people of color, one of the ways that they gain their strength and their hope has been through their faith and their faith experiences. It has been through their spirituality. And so I, I think for us as family therapists not to uh, recognize that, not to notice that, and not to um, uh, uh, engage families in that activity or in those activities in the work that we do is to our detriment and we do our families a disservice uh, if, we, if, if, we, uh, uh, fail to, if we fail to do that. Religion and spirituality. Many of our fundamental beliefs are found in religion and spirituality. Religions are organized belief systems that include shared and institutional moral values, beliefs about God and involvement in a religious community. Religions provide consistent patterns for living out these values and beliefs, 
as well as congregational support in times of crisis. Rituals and ceremonies offer participants a sense of collective self, a place in the chaos of reality. Congruence between religious beliefs and practices yields a general sense of well being and wholeness, while incongruence commonly induces shame or guilt. And so, again, it's important for us to understand that about the families with which we work, uh, that religion can be a really important uh, resource for them. Uh, it can also be harmful, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but for many, it's very uh, meaningful. And again, for many uh, uh, people of color, for people who are outside of the uh, 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 mainstream of America, uh, it can be central and, a, and an important focal point. And I think that, uh, again, as therapists, we have to be uh, mindful of and aware that, uh, uh, that that's a possibility. Spirituality, an overarching construct, involves personal beliefs such as those about an ultimate human condition or set of values toward which we strive, a supreme being or unity with uh, nature and the universe. It may also include uh, numinous experiences which are holy or mystical or difficult to define or explain in ordinary language or imagery. Spirituality involves an active investment in an eternal set of values, a sense of meaning, inner wholeness, and connection with others. It invites expansion of awareness with personal responsibility uh, for and beyond one's self. Uh, spirituality can be experienced either within or outside of uh, formal religious structures. Some adhere to religious rituals without finding spiritual meaning in them. Others disavow formal religion, yet find spirituality in daily life. Universally, the spirit is seen as the vital essence, the source of life and the source of power. So again, for many of our families, either religion or spirituality or some combination of both are, I think, are important uh, vehicles for helping uh, individuals find hope. Again, uh, going back to my story of slavery, I often wonder how did the slaves survive uh, in the conditions that were so abhorrent, that were so dehumanizing, that were so awful. I cannot imagine that myself, uh, being able to live under those conditions. But I think for many of them, they were able to survive because they saw that there was something beyond their current experience. They saw that there was something better or they believed that there was something better. And I think that that was a great resource of hope for them. I think for many of our families in our current society, that same uh, hopefulness can be gleaned from uh, religion and spirituality. Faith can even be more important in sustaining resilience and hopefulness uh, than frequent participation in religious services or activities. Medical studies suggest that faith and prayer and other spiritual rituals can actually strengthen health and healing by triggering emotions that influence uh, the immune and cardiovascular systems. Uh, one study of elderly patients who had undergone open heart surgery found that those who are able to find some hope, solace and comfort in their religious outlook had a survival rate three times higher than those who did not. What matters most is drawing on the power of faith to give meaning to a, a precarious situation. Uh, spiritual uh, beliefs and practices vary greatly Spiritual connectedness and renewal can be found in uh, communion with nature or an attraction to a guru or a place with high spiritual energy 
or healing waters or pilgrimages or sacred shrines and temples. Beauty in many forms can have a spiritual uh, healing effects. And we can be inspired by great art and music and literature and drama that express our common humanity. Our imaginations can transport us beyond a crisis situation, enable us to envision new possibilities or to illuminate pathways out of our dilemmas. Uh, creativity is often born of adversity. Many artists and particularly uh, artists of color and artists who have experienced uh, harmful and tragic uh, circumstances uh, acknowledge this. Uh, in uh, uh, Ralph Ellison, uh, for instance, the writer describes his own creative process as trying to the best of his ability transform the brutalizing elements of the African-American experience into art. His goal was not to escape, but to work through the experience to transcend it, just as through uh, music, the blues transcends the painful conditions with which uh, that music deals. Uh, the linchpins of hope, resilience, faith, and intimacy are linked. Faith is inherently relational from early childhood when fundamental meanings about life are shaped within caregiving relationships. Uh, caring about others sustains us and infuses our lives with meaning. One of the uh, books that has meant so much to me throughout the whole of my uh, career has been uh, uh, work by Viktor Frankl uh, in recounting his life in the Nazi prison camps. Uh, he came to the realization that salvation is found through love. As he visualized the image of his wife, a thought crossed his mind. I did not even know if she was still alive. I knew only one thing, which I've learned well by now, that love uh, goes very far beyond the physical person of the beloved. It finds its deepest meaning in its spiritual being, in its inner self. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna skip through some of this because I'm, I realize that I'm getting my time is getting away uh, from me. Uh, so um, uh, transformation can occur through uh, uh, crisis. Often, growth comes through crisis. Uh, though painful and disruptive life crises uh, and developmental transitions can serve as an impetus for reflection on assumptions, which can catalyze growth and transformation. Resilient individuals and families often emerge from shattering crises with a heightened moral compass and a sense of purpose in, our, in their lives. Uh, and this is just a truism in life that often the difficulties that people experience that they go through can render them uh, stronger and better and more hopeful and more helpful uh, than if they had not gone through that experience. It's not a thing that you would wish for, but when going through it, one can emerge from that uh, in, a, uh, in a better circumstance than they were before, uh, uh, be before they uh, had experienced it. As crises are assimilated, they may come to be seen as a gift that opens a new phase of life or new potentials. Many resilient families believe that their trials have made them more than what they would have been otherwise. Um, for all family members, crises may become an epiphany 
crystallizing a stronger sense of life purpose, dedication to the practice of their values and to practice them more fully and a deeper appreciation of, of loved ones. So much can be learned from studies of resilience to inform programs and interventions to strengthen families in crisis or in persistent distress. First, we can encourage a family's belief system and a community environment uh, to increase both hope and possibilities. Uh, small successes can lead to larger ones and a ripple effect, building confidence to master more difficult changes. We can also build a collaboration and mutual support so that shared efforts make a difference. And third, we can offer the perspective that adversity and failure are to be expected as normal parts of life and can be valuable ways of learning. Most importantly, we can convey our convictions in each family's worth and potential for resilience. And finally, I want to uh, end this formal part of the talk by sharing some questions. Uh, again, a dear friend of mine, uh, Paulette Moore Hines, uh, shared in an article that she wrote a few years ago, uh, or, or a chapter that she wrote a few years ago uh, in a uh, book edited by Monica McGoldrick. And these are questions that are both for us as therapists and that are also for families as they map their process of moving from hopelessness to hopefulness. So the questions are as follows, and we should ask ourselves and that we could also ask our families, when you feel hopeless, what are the cues? Is there a particular person, image, thought, or story that you are likely to access to help you cope? What are the cultural messages and family stories that have been passed down to you about coping with adversity? How are your personal beliefs and patterns of coping similar to or different from those held by most people in your family or culture? Are there situations that are rightly construed as hopeless? And I think this is a really important one. Are there some situations that are rightly construed as hopeless? Are there occasions when one may actually do harm by encouraging hope? To what extent is your way of responding to adversity different from those of the clients who have proven most challenging to, for you to work with in therapy? What strategies do you use to diminish burnout and revitalize yourself? And finally, how do you distinguish between when it is reasonable to continue therapy with a client and when you feel you should transfer the case because you feel hopeless about the potential for a positive outcome? So I leave you with those thoughts, those ideas, and those questions uh, in my uh, uh, thoughts about hope and hopefulness uh, tonight. I think hopefulness is a very important uh, quality for us to, uh, to, to look at and to, for us to pay attention to. And in uh, closing, I'd like to share with uh, two of my favorite uh, 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 people. I had the opportunity uh, a few years ago to spend an afternoon with uh, John Lewis. John Lewis is from Nashville. Uh, he uh, led the freedom marches 
and learn and was trained about the Freedom Marches here in Nashville. And Nashville is kind of a town that has really uh, adopted him and developed him. So he was here in town and I was blessed with the opportunity to spend some time with him and introduce him to my daughter. And one of the things that John Lewis says, uh, among the many things that he says that I think are so important are the following. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. And then finally, uh, Bishop Tutu. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite the darkness. Thank you so much for inviting me and I'll take questions now. Thank you uh, so much, William. Uh, uh, this has been a very deeply thought provoking um, lecture. Uh, and I'm sure that I um, um, can speak for those who have been listening that uh, it was so needed. And for you to bring to light uh, this very important uh, aspect of our work that often goes unnoticed and not explicitly stated. Uh, I think that as therapists that we must bring it to the forefront uh, because it is a life force for those clients that we work with. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, I am so glad that you uh, accepted this invitation. Um, uh, we have um, one person in the chat um, who says, many of my patients were feeling hopeful uh, because the pandemic was slowing down and then boom, war broke out. I would like some thoughts about how to help patients with this. Wow. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of us were experiencing that same sort of uh, 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 thing. Uh, I, you know, finally, we were getting to a point where uh, it seemed that things were going back to normal. And then uh, uh, this awful thing happened. A, a couple of things come to mind for me. Uh, first of all, I, I think um, whatever the circumstance we find ourselves in uh, and whatever the situation might be, there are things that we can learn from it. Just as in the poem that I read at the beginning uh, where in the pandemic, you can look for things that are potential positives or blessings or gifts to us, even in this horrible, atrocious war that we're experiencing. I think we see the capacity uh, for human beings to care about other human beings, to care about people across the world uh, and around the world who are uh, joining hands with uh, those who are in uh, Ukraine and the experiences that they are going through. Uh, it invites us to have an opportunity to look more deeply at what matters and what is meaningful in our world and in our lives and to uh, engage with or uh, this, this idea of having a kind of a reasonable hopefulness that maybe we won't have the kind of outcome of hope that makes everything uh, butterflies and rainbows, but that will uh, help us to better engage one another and see what's important in the world. You know, as I thought about the um, uh, political circumstances that we've been engaged in in the United States in the past five or six years that have caused so much uh, uh, turmoil, I, I, I think, well, what a horrible thing to happen, how awful it is. But then I stop and I think 
that has made me, as I think it has probably many other people, think about what really is important and how can I really be helpful uh, uh, in a circumstance where we live in a world that has a great deal of uh, cynicism, has a great deal of racism, has a great deal of uh, inhumanity. How can I and people like me find ways to meaningfully contribute to being a humane person to making this a better society. So I think the despair that we find ourselves in, the kind of um, hopelessness that we seem to find ourselves in, we can find the lesson to be learned, the uh, uh, humanity to be shared, the, uh, 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 the hope to be with which to be engaged in. Uh, those are those are some ways of thinking about it, and I, I think it goes back to that old um, uh, 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 tool that we have used forever in uh, family therapy, and that's just reframing the situation, reframing not to minimize or to make it not true what's going on, but to reframe it in a way to say, okay, I, this is what I have to deal with. What do I have to do to make that happen? And again, when I think back about my ancestors, those people who were slaves and what they must have gone through uh, every single day of their lives, what was it that made not only them um, survive, but in many circumstances, they were people who were thrivers. When I think about Harriet Tubman and I think about Frederick Douglass and I think about you know individuals like that, what was it that said, I, I'm going to keep on keeping on, that I'm going to uh, continue to persist? And I think it was a hope that the world could be better than it was uh, than, it, than it was in that day. And, uh, and, and I think I often have to uh, help my clients come to that recognition or that realization. Uh, for instance, I've dealt with many clients who've had... Um, uh, uh, who had cancer and who were dealing with cancer. And the um, um, prognosis was not good in the moment. And so helping them to find a way to manage one day at a time and to make the most of uh, the life circumstances that they were in in that moment and how to live a fuller, more complete life than they might have lived had that not been visited upon them. I, I think are ways that you can help people who are in, in, in those, um, uh, who, are, who are dealing with the sort of difficulties of the moment uh, to deal with it. And I think that's especially true with what's going on right now uh, in, in, in Ukraine. Um, six weeks ago, or maybe uh, at least two months ago, I don't, I don't know that I thought about Ukraine. And now I think about it many times every day. And not only do I think about it, but I try to figure out things that I can do personally to be helpful to um, people who are living there, who are, uh, who are in that circumstance, how I can help the world to bear witness to the atrocities that are being done and help us to find a way to find answers to that. I think all of us are in those kind of circumstances. And, um, uh, and, and, and so I think it, 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 it's, it's not so much about just being optimistic about this horrible situation, but I think recognizing the reality of it and saying, okay, this is what this is the hand that I'm dealt. This is the world that we live in. This is the way that things are. Uh, what can we do? What action can we take? And I think hope, ultimately, real hope is action oriented. It's not just a feeling or it's not just an idea. But I think real hope is about what can I do? What will I do to uh, improve my circumstances? What will I do to find myself in a better place or a better space? And, uh, and, and I think sometimes just helping clients to figure out what that might look like, what that might feel like, what that might be like, 
uh, could be helpful in that circumstance. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. In the meantime, um, I was wondering if you might um, speak to why you think our field of marriage and family therapy uh, has uh, not fully embraced uh, spirituality, faith, hope, uh, resilience, uh, at least uh, explicitly so. I think there are several reasons. One, I think that we have probably seen it as being the domain of, of uh, uh, clergy, of uh, um, philosophers, of uh, theologians, and not necessarily our domain. I think that's one reason that we probably haven't embraced it enough. I think also, uh, relatively speaking, as a profession, we still are relatively young compared to, you know, psychology and psychiatry and some other, uh, uh, and even social work. And I think that we are, I think that we were so uh, intent on presenting ourselves as a profession and having uh, sort of a professional identity and some of the, uh, um, uh, uh, the ideas that you have uh, mentioned don't have not always been embraced by those other groups. And so we steered away from them because we wanted to be viewed by other, uh, uh, in, others in the health, uh, helping professions as just as uh, professional as they are. So I think that that's a second reason. I, I think um, also, uh, that uh, particularly as we have uh, uh, changed in marriage and family therapy, in my opinion, whereas earlier on, I think we were much more focused on uh, uh, families of color and poor families. We have become a profession that's much more geared toward uh, upper middle class and highly educated folks. And those people tend to be uh, less uh, attracted to dealing with uh, uh, spirituality and religion uh, overtly. <laughs> I think they deal with it. I just don't think they necessarily talk about it or deal with it overtly. And so I think um, we haven't uh, uh, em em embraced it in quite that way. And then I think we haven't had within our movement or within our profession, a really strong voice for looking at those kinds of things. So one of the things that happened in psychology uh, was when Martin Seligman became the president of the American Psychological Association and the president of the American Psychological Association gets to set the agenda for psychology for the years of his or her, um, her um, uh, uh, reign or their, or, her, or, or time and power. And uh, Seligman was a person who really embraced the idea of positive psychology, positive psychology looked at hope, positive psychology looked at spirituality, it looked at things like the soul and, and, uh, and so a real movement I think grew in psychology around that. And, uh, and so, um, so uh, I, I think uh, they embraced that. I think with uh, the medical profession, uh, it, it was just the reality that they were dealing with people who were uh, on the, you know, death's doorstep. They were, you know, and, and, and people often came to them saying, God is important to me. Uh, this is important to me. The last rites are important to me. All of those kinds of things. And I think... Uh, I think that people in that profession, the doctors and the nurses in particular, began to say, well, we're seeing something here. Our patients who seem to have, um, you know, faith, who seem to have hope, who seem to have, you know, um, embraced these kinds of ideas, seem to fare better than those who don't. And I think they were just really curious, why is this so? 
And I think they began to study it, to write about it, and to uh, convince the powers that be at NIH and NIMH that this is something we ought to look at. We're not asking you to embrace religion. We're just saying that we notice that people who have embraced this seem to fare better. They live longer. They are happier in their dispositions. They, uh, even when they are in pain, they seem to manage it better than people who do not. So I, I don't think we've had uh, uh, people in our professions at the forefront at, at our, in our, who, have, who have really uh, lobbied this idea, these ideas. And, 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 and again, it's not to say that there aren't people who haven't, because I, 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 like I mentioned, Froma has talked about that, Froma Walsh. Uh, Harry Aponte has talked about it for a long time. Uh, Paulette Moore Hines has written beautifully about these kinds of issues, but it's not typically what we see, and particularly on the idea of hope explicitly and specifically, we just don't do that. We, we, we haven't done that. Thank you. And as a researcher, uh, I'll, do you have some thoughts about um, how we might begin to uh, explore look at these issues, uh, especially since so much is related to evidence-based um, practices these days. Uh, so I'm curious uh, if you have some thoughts regarding that. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think it's important for us to look at it. Um, um, one, I, I just think step out and not be afraid to do it. I, I know for me as a researcher um, earlier in my career uh, on in tenure tracks, uh, you want to not engage in research that's so um, uh, controversial. That, that was what I was taught. And so I didn't look at those kinds of uh, ideas earlier in my career, even though they always drove every question that I asked or I thought about, or, or I would try to figure out a way of talking about them without actually talking about it. So I try to figure out the you know, nice psychological term for talking about, you know, belief and faith and that kind of thing, but as to not um, um, uh, uh, tip anybody off or make anybody think that I was serious about the work that I did. But, um, but you know, once I got tenure and I didn't care about those kinds of things, I just started asking good questions and realized that uh, I was probably a little too timid to start with. Uh, if you ask the questions and if you do the research and you do it in a really good scientific way that has really um, good, uh, 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 you know, scientific methodology associated with it, then whatever question you ask, you can ask. And so uh, the, the problem with so many uh, of us in family therapy is that we're not doing, um, you know, that kind of research. Um, I, I shouldn't say it's so much a problem because people have made the choices that they've made and most of the folks in our field are really in the sort of clinical side of it. But I think if you can find ways of pairing up with um, researchers, if you're more engaged in clinical practice, but you're still interested in having these kinds of questions answered, then that, that might be a, a, you know, an approach to take pairing up with somebody who's a researcher, but you have the, uh, the expertise with the families, you have access to them, you have uh, uh, the real everyday working knowledge of how this works. So it doesn't matter what the researcher tells you, if you know in your practice that it doesn't work that way. So, pair up with somebody who is a researcher and say, well, this is what I see. Can we, you know, test that out? And so I think that's one, that's one thing that we could do. But I think the other thing that is um, happening now, uh, and this was not the case when I, I you know, I, 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 I for a long time was on study sections for NIH and NIMH. I was one of the people who reviewed grants and contracts that came in for peer review. And um, uh, there weren't a lot of grants, first of all, that were uh, submitted that dealt with these topics. And second, when they were submitted, they didn't necessarily have very good uh, research methods associated with them. And, uh, and um, 
but I think had they, uh, I, I think that um, uh, review panels would have been really happy to take a look at them and to, um, uh, and to study them. Uh, now the MDs were sending those in, but the family therapist and the psychologist and uh, psychiatrists weren't at the time. I think that's happening more now. I think there's a open door for that. And I think more people are looking at that. I think in addition to um, going for grant funding from NIH or NMH, uh, there are uh, foundations, uh, private foundations that are very, um, you know, wealthy <laughs> that are willing to, um, uh, to uh, fund projects along those lines. And, uh, and so maybe look in that, uh, in, in, that in, in that direction. Uh, and then um, uh, one of the things that I've been in, excited about doing the last couple of years is there's a group of, um, uh, of, of folks at Yale University that's actually headed by a theologian uh, who that's actually, and I, and I was invited to come to this conference that they held because they were really interested in looking at the virtues and hope was one of the virtues. And they were really particularly interested and they had a psychologist on the team, but they didn't have a person who, who was actually trained in family dynamics and family relations. So I was brought on the team for that. And so there's like a whole group of us. There's a theologian, there's a psychologist, there's sociologist, anthropologist, but a whole group of people who are at the table uh, doing studies on these kinds of things and uh, looking at it from the perspective of their particular discipline. Uh, I, I think finding ways of getting involved or engaged in those kinds of um, activities is really important. And, um, and so I think that can be really uh, meaningful. And finally, I think if you find yourself in a circumstance, and, and this is particularly true for those of you who are more academically related, but if you find yourself in a circumstance where you don't feel like you're supported and want to, wanting to look at that kind of work or ask those kinds of questions or to pursue that um, line of research, then go someplace else. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I know that's easier to say than not, but, uh, but I think that uh, there are some institutions that embrace that. One of the things that I love about where I am currently now, it's, a, it's the first time in my career that I have been at a smaller, more liberal arts type of university, but they love asking the big questions and the big ideas and to talk about faith and, uh, and, and science and all of those kinds of things. Whereas uh, when I was at my previous institution, which I loved at Vanderbilt, I didn't always feel supported in wanting to look at those kinds of ideas in that particular environment. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have another question, and that question is asking if you could give a clinical example of how you help families or individual patients feel hopeful. Um, well, okay. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I have over the course of my career worked with a number of um, families who are coming to see me because they're trying to figure out how to deal with a, um, uh, 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 a uh, health related problem. I, I, I've done a lot of work around health and healthcare and, and, and they are families who have, uh, where, where somebody has been diagnosed with terminal cancer and they're trying to figure out how they're going to not only manage as an individual who has that disease, but uh, also how the rest of the family is going to carry on and uh, not be depressed in uh, the loss of, in this case I'm thinking about it, it was of the primary parent, the mother. I mean, there are two parents, but the mother was the primary caregiver and the person who uh, the children were most, um, 
uh, connected to. And this was a, also an African-American family. And, um, and, 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 and they were having a sort of uh, uh, a crisis of hope. Uh, they felt hopeless and they felt desperate. And, uh, and so I, I really tried to work with them to help them to, to think about the, their lives and their circumstances and the circumstance that they found themselves in. Uh, and uh, to deal with the anger that was associated with that, to deal with the um, faith it, uh, uh, issues that they were having. They were like, we believed in God, we'd go to church and now she has cancer and she's going to die. How is this the case? Um, um, uh, the children were scared. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to, they were scared in their own lives. They didn't know how to, uh, uh, plan uh, for their future. They couldn't see a future. And uh, so, so there were just all of those kinds of issues going on. And so, um, uh, so what we did was to just have a serious come to Jesus sort of talk about it. I think, first of all, we had to deal with the faith issues in this family because they were front and center. And, and, and I just let people... Um, I gave people an opportunity to uh, to vent, to talk about those kinds of things, to uh, to, um, to to put on the table what their issues were, what their uh, concerns were, what their anger was about, and uh, and quite often when uh, families are going through these kinds of difficulties, nobody really uh, offers an opportunity for them to. Uh, to have that conversation, particularly the faith conversation, because uh, the faith community is saying, just trust in God, just believe in God, everything's going to be okay, everything's going to work out. And that's the last thing that they're feeling right now. They're like, I believed in God, I cared about God, and all of this kind of stuff. So I think helping them to vent, not only vent about that, but to deal, to, to get it out on the table, and to uh, then uh, think about ways of, of either reframing that for themselves in a way that made sense or helping them to uh, question about whether or not this was something they wanted to continue to do. And in this particular case, they did decide that they needed to, that they wanted to um, continue to be people of faith because it was important to them and it had been a source of, uh, of, of strength and solace for most of their lives. And they could see even now still going through it. But I think helping them to, to, to deal with that and to have the um, uh, opportunity to do that and to kind of reframe their anger uh, around that and how it might, uh, or ask them questions about how might God see this? How might he think about what you're going through right now. And again, what might you learn from this that might be useful to you as you move forward, how it might be useful for somebody else, you know, as they're dealing with it. So that was one of the uh, things that we did. And then once we got past uh, those issues, or I shouldn't say past it, but once we had gotten to a place where people were um, able to manage that in a better way than they had been previously because they kept going back and forth with that. There were days where they were good about it, days when they were, weren't uh, helping them to, uh, uh, to strategize a, 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 you know, a, a plan for, you know, what do we do as we uh, think about moving forward? How do we, uh, uh, you know, what is our plan for helping mom? Uh, you know, as she continues along with this, what is our plan for um, mom being uh, being more making herself ready for uh, you know the ultimate transition that she has to make, and um, and and I think it was in that that uh, it was kind of that sort of idea of reasonable hope. It wasn't like oh, I'm just hoping that there's going to be a miracle that happens and everything's going to get 
all right. I mean, hopefully that would happen, but the likelihood of that happening was not very good. But there were ways that you could deal with uh, the day-to-day uh, circumstances that um, made it more uh, manageable and meaningful and uh, 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 important uh, for them as they went forward. I, I think ultimately in that particular family, uh, and, and the mother did die, um, uh, she died in a place that I think was, uh, she was in a good place uh, in, in, her, in, her, in her emotionality, uh, in her spirituality, uh, in, in her um, uh, concern about her children and having made a kind of a plan for them uh, as uh, she knew she would no longer be there. Uh, it was, uh, it, it was better. It was in, the children were ultimately in a better place. That they were uh, uh, ten and thirteen at the time, so that's a tough age anyway. But they, but it was a it was a time of uh, uh, when they were able to. Um, I think they were able to feel like they had said the things that they had said that needed to be said. They had done things that they, that I think will be positive memories for them, the way that they were able to uh, care for their mother and to treat her and take care of her toward the end. And so it's, 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 it's that kind of work that I think helps people rather than being angry and desperate and, uh, 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 and feeling an overwhelming sense of despair they were able to uh, have some peacefulness uh, and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a vision for uh, their future for the ones who were, going, who were left behind. And for the mother who was going on, I think she had some peace of mind in believing that she had done all that she could do to uh, ensure a brighter future for them. Thank you, um, William. Uh, do we have any more questions or comments? Uh, please put them in the Q&A if you do. I don't see anything forthcoming, so I want to take this time to express deep gratitude to you for bringing this really important uh, topic in the field of marriage and family therapy uh, to light and uh, for um, giving us all um, a way of talking openly about uh, hope and resilience, faith, spirituality uh, uh, with our families, rather than just getting caught up, uh, uh, afraid to say anything because most of us think uh, religion as opposed to thinking about those other aspects, uh, those virtues, uh, such as hope, et cetera, and that people have their various uh, uh, religions or uh, faith practices, experiences that are meaningful to their lives. And I think uh, critically important of the cultural heritage that uh, we have and recognizing that our clients have those different cultural heritages that then help them to be resilient and going toward those as opposed to uh, assuming, uh, you know, sort of an American culture uh, or uh, not thinking about people's um, individual practices and experiences that they've had. So thank you uh, very much and I will ask if you have any uh, final words that you would like to uh, leave with us. I, I just want to say again, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic that I love talking about and enjoy talking about and believe is really important uh, for our field to embrace uh, in a greater way than we have done uh, so before. 
And I'm really excited about this because I'm uh, currently writing a book on this topic. And so uh, every time I get a chance to talk about it, it uh, gives me an opportunity to refine my own thinking about it and to uh, 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 just uh, understand the significance and importance of of looking at this from a family therapy perspective. So again, I appreciate your uh, in, invitation and I thank you for all of those who were able to uh, attend and be a part of it. Thank you very much. And for our participants, uh, this ends our uh, Distinguished Family Therapy Lecture Series for this academic year, but we will be having it again next year and hope that you will look forward to attending more uh, lectures with us at Ackerman. So uh, thank you to everyone and uh, be well. And um, you know, let's remember uh, to look beyond the immediate crisis and think about ways that we can be helpful. And I especially like that hope is action oriented, you know, that we don't just have it as a feeling, but that we think about what we can do. So thank you so much. And I will be in touch with you, uh, William. And to all of our participants, we will let you know when the recording is available for you. We will send it to you. We will also send to you those resources that uh, uh, Dr. Turner is going to forward to me. So thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening or day, depending on where you are. Uh, and uh, have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Great. Good night.